So you've taken a huge step and purchased your first income producing property. Congratulations for you. I am so happy for you. You've sacrificed your time, energy, and money. You saved up. You had a vision for where you wanted to go and now you have done it. You've closed on it and you own the property. But what do you do now? Today, I want to share with you my 20 biggest mistakes that I made by my first piece of real estate back in 2004. All the mistakes I made, probably no doubt more than 20, but I wanted to narrow it down to my biggest ones. So when you get out there in the field to get a tenant and place them in your property, you don't lose money like I did. All right. So let's go over these 20 right now. Greetings class, it's Chris Haskins with TheRealEstateRoundup.com. My mission and ministry is to raise your financial literacy through real estate investing and entrepreneurship. So today I've got a special video for you. I've been thinking about this for years and years. You know, so many ideas, so much training that I need to give you to bring you up to speed on in the, for your real estate business. So today I figured I wanted to share with you all the mistakes that I've made. Well, I, I boiled it down to 20 so many mistakes that I made. So 20 will kind of get you started so you won't lose as much money as I did. I can't count, I don't even know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of um, mortgage payments that I've made, lost rent, people just dragging me out, not paying rent, taking from me, damaging property, stealing from me. So many things that I've learned that I've boiled it down to these 20 so you don't have to suffer like I did. So the crazy thing about it is look at, the, look at this uh, handout here. TransUnion says that just about half of the rental properties out there are managed by the owners. They are self-managed. So today's video is gonna help you manage your own property without having to go out and hire a management company because a lot of times those people, they're not gonna do you right anyway. You gotta find the right ones. So let's get right down to it. Number one, allowing pets. Allowing pets round up. Allowing pets. Uh, I remember when I was starting out, I wanted to I wanted my tenants to think that I was a good landlord, right? And I wanted to, I, I had, like perhaps I had their best interest at heart, I let, allowing them to have tenants. But let me tell you what happened to me. I had a friend, she had a pit bull. And you know, dogs like to jump up on the front door, the screen door, they would, she would jump on the screen door and she pushed that screen door out, got out. Uh, long story short, she ripped up somebody's arm. My friend had a $100,000 lawsuit. So for me, we don't allow pets. And a matter of fact, if you go right here, there's a video <clears throat> for my friend and attorney Jessica. Matter of fact, she's a judge now, represented a homeowner that had a dog bite, right? And they found this homeowner. Terrible story. So you're going to see that video uh, with Jessica Siegel, how she had to rep. She had she was a part. She was representing one of the parties in that lawsuit. So you're going to you, you'll see how that works. So allowing pets, you don't want to have any bites, and you don't have you don't want to have any damages. This doggy poo urine on the floor. I mean, it just can make your property down in value. You take your property down in value and it's a liability. So just don't do it. Don't allow people to have pets and that way you don't have to worry about it. Okay. Now listen, if you want to fast forward up back and forth through, through all this stuff, there's a timeline in the video description. If you don't want to hear me talk about all of them, you can go back and forth just to kind of make sure you get it all, all covered, get the basis covered. And I'm going to give you a handout too. Make sure you stay to the end. I'll tell you where that's at. Number two, one year leases. What I was doing when I started out, I was offering one year leases. I learned over time and I can't take credit for this one. I got to thank my boy, Mike Butler showed me that, you know what? You can do three year leases. We do three year leases on every tenant, right? Every tenant. And when I sit down and do the application process, I tell them straight up front, I'm Ms. Smith. We do three year leases. Do you have a problem with that? You see my posture, you see my, my, my posture, my composure, my, my posture round up. I want you to know uh, if you tell people that you do three year leases off the top, you won't have any problems. You won't have any issues with it. Don't do one year leases because it goes by very fast. You're moving somebody in February, March. Next thing you know, it's February, February, March next year. It's going by so fast and they're moving out and the property. What really wears and tears on a property? People moving in and out, in and out, right? Move, bumping into walls, busting up stuff, scraping paint floors. Man, stress, stress a property out, moving in and out. Number three, being friendly versus being friends. Being friendly versus being friends. What do you mean by that, Chris? Well, I, when I, I remember moving in tenants, I don't know, back in 2004, five and six, 
I was trying to be their friend, talking about family stuff, children, what's going on in their lives, how you doing, uh, what can I do to help you? Mm -mm. We want to be there, be friendly, but not try to be their friends. Be extremely friendly to people and compassionate. Oh, Ms. Smith, this is what we need to do today. Uh, okay, okay, well, you, you're telling me about your day. I'm sorry to hear that. Sorry to hear you had a, um, a sick family member, flat tire, you had something happen to your, your, your loved one. I'm very sorry to hear that. We have compassion, but I don't want to get too deep with people, right? They're telling me about their life story and about their ex and their current relationship, and then you're starting to console them and all that stuff. Roundup, don't get involved with it. If they try to give you that energy, always say, I do understand. Ms. Smith, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. That's terrible. You know, keep it back on business. Don't cut them off. But you see, when you're screening tenants, it's a little bit different than you're screening motivated sellers. You want to let a motivated seller dump as much on you as possible. But when you're dealing with a tenant, I don't want to get too personal because once you get too personal, then people start pushing. They start pushing, pushing, pushing. Next thing you know, you're giving them a, a month of rent for free, a month rent for free. Don't do it. So we want to be friendly, but not friends. OK, number four, 90 day vacate notice. What I was doing was I, I was giving I was asking people to give me 30 day vacate notices. What is that? So when you have a tenant move in with you, uh, you need to make sure that they give you a certain amount of time before they move out. So when I started out, I thought 30 days will be fine. Uh uh. I want you doing 90 days. So we want to stack the deck in our favor, y'all. Not in the tenant's favor, in your favor. So if they give you a 90 day notice to vacate, 90 days, that's going to give you ample time, not only to get mentally prepared for all the uh, stuff that you're going to deal with, moving them out, getting a new tenant, screening tenant, utilities off and on, turning it around, cleaning it up, painting carpet, fixing stuff, all that. 90 days will give you enough time to get ready for that. You can possibly, what I've done in the past, I find a new tenant in that 90 days, right? As opposed to what do we generally do? What I did in 2004, 5, 6, 30 day notice. Don't do it. Just don't do it. So in your lease, 90 day notice to vacate. And if, uh, that's going to give you more than enough time. And if they don't give you the 90 day, 90 day notice, then you can bargain with some of the security deposit or push them out even longer, right? So listen, if you want to get some of my documents, some of my rental documents, that link will be in the video description. I'm giving, I'm giving them to you for free. Uh, we'll go over some of those docs in a minute. Number five, taking personal checks. Oh my Lord, Roundup. <laughs> How many checks did I accept from my tenants that bounced before I just made it a company rule? Boom, no more. No more personal checks. Cash or money orders or cashier's check only. Cash, money order, cashier's check only. My real estate roundup homies. How many times did I deposit checks and they just bounced? Then I got bank fees, reverse check fees, all that stuff. Plus I had to cover the mortgage for the month, right? I had mortgages at that time. So roundup, if you just don't take personal checks, you don't gotta deal with it. So for, uh, I don't remember what, when I made that decision, but I just said, you know, it's just not worth the mental stress not knowing who's going to have the money in there. And then people will give me a check and say, Chris, don't cash it until this day. I'm like, I'm not doing that. And I'm encouraging you not to do that. Since you're a new landlord, you may or may not know. People will try to get over on you from time to time. OK, from time to time. Number six, uh, we want a keeping track of late fees. I didn't keep track of late fees. Right. So let's say during the year you had your tenant pay late. I don't know, five times they may or may not have paid the, the late fee in there. So what I do now is I keep on all my rental properties. I have a ledger in my folder. You open up the folder. It has a piece of paper here that has all of the late fees while that tenant lived in the property. And it has one column that says, did they pay? Another column says they did not pay. So if they don't pay the late fee, you have to make sure you remember that. So when they move out, then you can deduct that from the security deposit, right? But before I would, when they, when I was just happy for them to pay the rent. I'm like, oh, look. if the rent was a thousand dollars and the late fee was a hundred dollars, if they deposited a thousand dollars, maybe on the 10th, 11th or 12th, I was just happy to get the rent. I'm like, thank God I got the rent. I wouldn't even remember the, the, the late fees. But now 
you remember, you write them down, and if they don't pay them, when they go to move out, then you can boom, 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 deduct those from the security deposit. And man, that is gonna save you a lot of money right there. We don't wanna just forget, just wipe them away, right? They owe you this money. They cause you the stress of not paying the mortgage on time, right? So write them all down, each and every one of them that they don't pay. Number seven, uh, I want you to be the manager and not the owner. Be the manager of the property and not the owner. What I was doing back in the day was, I'm the man, I'm the owner. I'm the owner, right? The buck stops with me. I'm big, bad owner. Uh, uh You don't want to do that. Just like all religions uh, refer to a higher power, right? Religions say, this is not me talking. This is God talking, right? So listen, when you're managing property, if you're the owner and you walk in as the owner, they know you can make all the decisions. Any repairs that need to be done, any paperwork that needs to be adjusted, them getting their security deposit back, all that. But if you're just a manager, right, and you work for the owner, then you can pass all of that stress and those big decisions to the owner roundup. So now when you interface with your tenants and they say, well, Mr. Haskins, I think I wanted to uh, I wanted a pet or I wanted to extend my lease or cut my lease short for six months. Would you guys mind uh, allowing me to do that? Well, Mr. Smith, I check with them. I'm, uh, I'm just a property manager. I check with them and they're not going to allow that. They're, they're just they're just not going to allow that. So if you're the manager, you're the manager, you get to pass that energy on to the owner. But if you're the owner, they're expecting you to make a decision right then and there. Don't be the owner when you're interfacing with your tenants. It's gonna make your life a lot easier, okay? Okay, moving along. Uh, number eight, verify income, verify income. It wasn't until later into my career, I, I wasn't verifying income. When I started out, people would say what they made, they turn in their bank statements to me or their check stubs from, from the job. And what I learned was sometimes people can work overtime for a small amount of time and get a big check and then go back to their regular schedule and their check will be much smaller. So they can give you a check or some check stubs that are huge and they might have worked 20 hours overtime. But then for the following few weeks, their check might will be a lot smaller when they go back to work in their 40 hours. So you must have an employment, an employment verification, an employment verification. Right. And this is a document. Matter of fact, I'll go ahead and give you I'll give that I'll give you my employment verification for free. There's a link in the video description. You can go to download my employment verification along with some other rental documents. you got to verify this stuff. How much money are you making? Generally speaking, I want them to make it almost just about three times the rent. But the employment verification will allow you to interface with their employer to find out exactly what they made, how much they make, how long have they been on the job. And sometimes if they haven't been on the job for two years, I might, I might ask them to pay a double deposit. Don't be ashamed to ask people to pay a double deposit. I mean, it's just part of doing, part of doing business. You need to protect your asset and your tenants are like employees. You're screening a new employee that's coming to work for you, okay? So verify their income. I didn't. I didn't do it. I took their word for it and I lost every time. I lost every time roundup. Number nine. What I used to do, I'd have the rent due on the first of the month. I would have the rent due on the first of the month. Horrible mistake. Horrible mistake. Now our rents are due on the 28th of the current month for the following month. So, so for instance, if it's, uh, I don't know, June 28th, the rent for July is due June 20, 28th, right? Let me let that sink in for a little bit because some people think that, I can't tell you how many of my tenants, applicants will say, I thought June 28th was when the June rent was due. Oh, no, 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 no. The following month, the rent is due in June for July, right? Why do we do that? Well, Chris, what happens is all the new bills come out the first of July. You got cell phone bill, gas bill, power bill, car note, health insurance, kids, whatever, all credit card. All the new bills are due come the first of the month, right? They're thinking about first of the month. I don't want to be jumbled up in all of those bills. I want you to think about me before the next month comes. And if you do that, your rent, let's just say your rent's $1,000 by the first, then you have a late fee on the first of a $100 late fee, but we want to get that in first, right? And I'm here to tell you guys, if you make it clear up front before your tenant moves in, Ms. Smith, now our, our, our rents are due on the 28th of the month. Will that be a problem? See my face? Be very, very stern with people. Be very, very stern. Be friendly, but not friends. So I will include 
um, my residential lease. You can get my lease for free. I'll give that to you along with my employment verification. I'm feeling giving today. I want, I want, you, I want you guys to succeed. Number 10, I didn't send out and file the proper notices. I just didn't send it out. What would happen was my tenants would call and they say, Chris, I have the, I'm going to have the rent to you by Friday. Let's say the Friday was the 10th. I would just hope and pray, sit and wait. Okay, see if they're going to have the rent. Friday come, no rent. I stopped doing that after about, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 of those. So now we file the paperwork on time, each and every time, regardless of what the tenant tells us, right? I don't care what they say. Matter of fact, I don't even need to talk to you because there are, uh, there's a protocol regarding dealing with tenants with a, with, and you can get that with your landlord tenant handbook and whatever city state you're in, you can, what I've seen, you can generally Google landlord tenant handbook PDF and you can get it for free right on the internet, whatever state you're in. Every state has a different one. So sending out these notices, boom, in Virginia, fifth, five day pay or quit. I did that, boom, we're gonna go down to the courthouse file our unlawful detainer, file for eviction. Now you do that regardless if the tenant is telling you they're going to pay or not. Because people will say, I'm going to pay Friday just to put you off your game, get you off your G, right? Oh, I'm going to pay, I'm going to pay by Friday. I got clients calling me all the time. Chris, my tenant says it's going to pay this day. They said they're going to give me $500. They said they're going to give me this. I don't care what they say. Go file that paperwork. File it. If they're late, mail out the pay or quit notice, right? If they don't pay, pay by that date, go down to the courthouse and file it. Now, what you can do, what happens is you have filed your paperwork. You reserved your court date. Now, if they pay, that's cool, right? If they pay, okay, thank you for the money. You can, uh, you can, you can stop that court date or put it off to the next month. But if you wait for them to pay, then time's ticking because it takes 30 to 45 days just to get on the court docket, right? So you file it, go down there and make sure it's there so if they don't pay, boom, you got your court date. You got your court date, right? So make sure you file it whether they tell you they're going to pay or not, right? Just file it. Number 11, communicating too much. Communicating too much. This kind of goes hand in hand with number 10. People tell you gonna, they're going to pay rent. They say, I'm going to have this much by this date. And you're calling them, hey, where's the rent? Texting them, what's going on? Stop all that talking. Ain't no talking no more. You know, and your tenant knows the rent is due each and every month, every month of the year. It's just due every month. So why are you calling? Where's the rent at? What time are you going to have the rent? Can we meet here? Are you going to mail it to me? Should I come get it from you? Stop doing all that talking. The more you're talking, you're giving up your power. I don't do any talking. They can text me. I might send out a text if, before I file a, a, an eviction paper. I might say, hey, I'm, uh, I've been instructed to file an eviction today. A lot of times I'll do that. But they'll t people, people, I got clients Chris, trying to get the rent. I need the rent. I need the rent. Stop talking to these people. There's nothing to talk about. Because remember, real estate speaks through documents. So mail it out, just like we said here. And don't worry about talking. Nothing to talk about. Rent's due, period. The rent is due. If it's not paid by this day, Late fee. If you don't pay by uh, after that, we're going to court. I'm done. All right. If you follow that rule, it's going to save you a lot of headache. Don't be like me. Oh, Miss Smith, can we get the rent? Are you going to pay this much? Well, how much do you have right now? Okay, I'll take 500. Oh, God. Don't do that. Don't do that. Number 12, not trying Section 8. Huge mistake for me. Sticking with private pay tenants. I can't, I believe it wasn't until 2010 until I got my first. So I was in business like six years before I tried my first Section 8 tenant. And when I did, it was like magic. The rent came on time each and every month, no matter what. And a lot of times, Section 8 tenants, the government will, will, the government will pay 100% of the rent, so they don't even have to pay anything. So that was a big mistake I made, y'all, not trying Section 8. I don't want you to be scared. Matter of fact, uh, if you look in the video description, I have a full training course showing you step-by-step -step how to locate, place, screen, and manage a Section 8 tenant where the government will pay the rent for them. They don't got to worry about collecting rent. All right. It took me years to figure that one out. Number 13, take pictures of damages. Take pictures of the damages. See, what happens when your tenant moves out, they're going to leave some type of damage, right? And then the lease that you're getting off the top, we've got like a $300 matriculation fee. Thank you, Hampton University. Matriculation fee on top of a carpet cleaning fee, which is going to help you, uh, suck up some of that security deposit that, that you have on file, right? This is with a, uh, an ordinary tenant.
But the damage, you want to take a picture, like I remember one time I had a tenant move out, they damaged my brand new carpet, right? They tried to cover it up and piece it up with some glue. Take a picture of it, send them the picture when, uh, when they move out, along with all the other repairs that you had to pay for with a dollar amount on them. So there's no question. Damaged carpet, $100. Cleaning, cleaning the carpet, another hundred dollars. I had a tenant one time leave a refrigerator in the house. I had to get the refrigerator, and so the house had two fridges. Refrigerator removal, I had to remove it, another hundred dollars. So you take a picture of it, put the dollar amount so they know exactly what you're charging them for. I have been to court, not for me, but for a friend of mine, didn't itemize all of the repairs that he, that he all the repairs and charges that he was holding, withholding the security deposit for, right? So the guy goes to court, the judge says, well, we don't think this is fair. We can't really justify this. Guy loses, my friend loses, right? Because he didn't have pictures of why he was holding back the money. So have pictures, y'all. You're gonna be glad you take pictures of all the damages that your tenants do when they move out and you hold back their security deposit. Okay, next, number 14, not trying lease options. Not trying lease options. Oh my goodness, I started studying lease options in 2007, eight. It wasn't until 2011 that I started to deploy them. Lease options is where we get a huge down payment and we lease our properties to tenant buyers. Tenant buyers, people that are in the mindset of an owner as opposed to being a renter, right? So when you do that, you may or may not have to sell the property at the end of the option period, but at least you get that huge down payment. So just consider doing a lease option. And if you wanna see how lease options are set up, how to go about all that stuff. There's another video for you right there so you can see how I walk you step by step how to do it. Number 15, not charging court fees to my tenants. Not charging for court fees. How many times did I go to court and the tenant would pay at the last minute? Let's say the rent was $1,000, they would come with their rent and their late fee of, that's, I don't know, $100. I would be so happy just to get the rent and the late fee. I forget to charge them the filing fee was $65, right? The processing fee for me to go down there and do that, I'm charging them for my time, right? I have to charge for that stuff. I mean, it's not free for me to go out, take time out of my day to go down there. And if they paid after I got possession of the property, then we had more share of paperwork. I mean, this stuff adds up hundreds and hundreds of dollars that you have with filing and legal fees. You need to recoup some of that with your tenant, right? So charge, pass that on to them, pass that stuff down. And if you got two people, it could be 70 or $80 just to file to evict them. So make sure you charge the court fees for your tenants. You need, to, you need them to pay for that. You shouldn't be paying for that. Number 16, not checking past eviction filings. Not checking those eviction filings. When I used to move in, I would believe my tenants when they told me, I've never been evicted. Okay, fill out, fill out the paperwork. Never been evicted? Great, all right, move, move right in. You cannot, you have to trust. Larry Gowen says, you have to trust but verify, trust, but verify. So now when I have a tenant fill out an application, I have, have you ever been evicted? Yes or no, if they put no, I go right to the court, to the state court website. I can see, I can pull it right up. I, boom, 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 have you been evicted? Your name is right there. So if there's an issue or a discrepancy, I can ask them, well, you said you were never evicted, but it says right here you were, then we can address that. And I'm not, if you had an eviction, once again, we can go back to that double deposit, right? You can do a double deposit for people. Okay, number 17, not giving out air filters. I didn't give out air filters years ago. So what happens is people, they just don't care about your stuff. They'll run the air filter till it's completely black and no air will go through there for your central heating and air unit. You'll be all tore up. So you go in there and cut it on and you'll see it. It's sticking, the air won't even go through. What that does is causes extra wear and tear on your heating and cooling system. And sometimes when you, trade, when you take out the old filter and put a new one in, it will damage it because of the airflow is just not used to it. It's, getting, it's, it's gotten all clogged up with dirt and debris, right? And that's more money. So what we do now, I just have a list of all my properties, the size of the air filters, and we just drop them off every three months. Just give them the air filters. Yes, it's gonna cost you a little bit of time and energy and effort, but just give them the air filters. You'll be happy that you did because you don't want to depend on them to replace these air filters, right? Number 18, speaking to previous landlords. 
speaking to previous, notice the keyword here is speaking to previous landlords. So when they fill out the application, we have a landlord verification that has all these questions. Were they ever late? Did they have any problems? Did they have a pet? How much was the rent? Um, did they have any issues with the next door neighbors? All that stuff, would you rent to them again? All of that. But sometimes people, they have friends and family fill out these documents. So you don't know if it's actually the true previous landlord, right? So I want to speak to them and ask them, Hey, Miss previous landlord, tell me about the tenant. Why are they moving out? Why are you evicting them? Are they moving on their own free will? Do you like them? Would you rent them again? I want to talk to them even after they filled out that filled out that document. And what I will do also, I'll give you my application. I'll include my application in that document pack for free. No problem. Um, so you asked us some questions and if it sounds fishy, like they, I remember one time I had a tenant, <laughs> they had a year lease, but they were breaking the lease at six months. And I talked to the previous landlord and the landlord told me, I asked him, well, are they breaking their lease? What's going on with that? And the, and the lady on the phone told me, I just like helping people. Well, you like helping people. I never heard of a landlord that just loves, would allow someone to break a lease just because they want to help somebody. So I went to, well, I, as I was on the phone with them, I went to the city assessment site to see when did they buy the property it was about five years ago. So I was testing to see if I was really talking to the real landlord or slash owner, right? Because a lot of times your tenants will be coming from a, a private paying landlord, which is the owner as well. So I'm like, uh, okay, that's cool. So I see they're breaking their lease. How long have you owned the property, Miss Jones? Uh, I just bought it a few months. I bought it last year. I'm looking at the, the city assessment and it says five years. Well, I'm saying, I, I'm looking here, Miss Jones. It says you bought it five years ago. Which one is it? Is it last year or five years ago? Click, phone went dead. Phone went dead. So you have to kind of push back a little bit, Roundup, when things, trust your gut. Trust your gut. If, if you have someone tell, if you have a landlord tell you, I like helping people, so I let them get out of the, get out of the lease, no recourse. I don't know. That sounded funny. But the only way to get that information was for me to talk to them. You have documents, yes. And some, and when you get these documents, if they're not email, smell them too. If they smell like smoke, whack them. We don't allow smokers. We don't rent to smokers. Number nineteen, driving by your property. This is twofold. We drive by prospective tenants properties and round up drive by your property. There is no one that's going to take care of your property or care about it more than you, more than you. Nobody's going to love your property or care about it more than you. So take some time, drive by there, see the condition of it, see how they're taking care of it. Is it trash outside? Are they running a, a trail in the front yard or the backyard? Have they broken the fence? Have they broken a window? Is the door broken? That way you can kind of keep an eye on it to see, hey, okay, are they taking care of my house? I need to get some things fixed or what's going on? Is there fighting going on? Is there a bullet hole? All that stuff. So you drive by your property once in a while. I drive by mine at least three to four times a year. Just drive by it. Put your eye on it. Is the roof gone? Is, there, are there, is it missing shingles? Could be so many things that you'll notice by just driving by that the tenant may or may not tell you about. And last but not least, number 20. Number 20. I used to think the property manager was going to handle everything. I would just own the property, have a property manager, manage the tenant, get the new tenant, collect the rent, give me the money. I don't have to think about the house. Oh Lord, was I mistaken. Oh my, I hope you don't have that philosophy. You buy the property, property management company comes in, manages it, you get a check and you're chilling. Real passive income, right? Mm -mm. Doesn't work like that, round up homies. Don't work like that. And even if you do have a good property manager, you have to manage the property manager. Okay. So I interviewed one of my friends, Sam, <laughs> this was the property manager from hell. Matter of fact, he went through, I don't know, three of them. I'm going to put that link here too. You can check out Sam's, um, Sam's nightmare real estate stories of his rental property. Property managers can be tough, right? So you have to ride them, make sure they're doing everything property. Let me tell you how property managers work. They collect the thousand dollar rent, any repairs that they did to the property, they take theirs off the top and then they give you what's left over and they get their fee. So if they got a $500 repair and they're getting their, let's say 10% uh, 10% of $1,000, they're keeping 600 and giving you four, right? So they're keeping the majority of the rent and you're just waiting to get your rent. So, and that's a good property manager. 
Because sometimes they'll do the work, they won't even do the right job, the right repairs, and still bill you. Okay, so you may or may not want to get a property manager starting off. You may, I don't know. But at least if you self-manage it like almost 50% of landlords do today, you'll know what questions to ask and how they do business and how to manage the property manager because you've already managed the tenant, right? So the property manager is only going to be as good as you selecting them. You have to know what questions to ask. When do you collect rent? How often do you pay out? Do you have your own construction company to, to do the repairs? Who do you hire to do, the rep to do repairs, right? So you got to know this stuff. So starting out, if you want to manage your own property, I'm cool with that, especially if you only have one. But don't think somebody's just going to manage your house and give you the rent and you're going to be wealthy sitting back chilling in Jamaica drinking drinks, right? Doesn't work like that, okay? You're going to have to be active with property managers. Round up, if I've helped you at all. This has been kind of a long one. There's so much, to, so much stuff to cover. Subscribe to the channel. Like this content. Share with any other investors that are getting into the rental business. You've taken the time. You put your money aside. You have earned the rights to be called landlord. I am happy for you. I don't take that lightly. I don't take this lightly. Only from my research, seven to eight percent of America even own rental property, and you are one of them. So welcome, welcome for coming on over. Listen, make sure you go download all my docs, my rental docs below, to help assist you with your property management career and your. You have the, this is called building wealth over time. Hopefully, you're going to have that tenant pay down that mortgage. So eventually, you have no mortgage and all the cash flow will be yours. This is Chris Haskins with the Real Estate Roundup. I'll see you with the next video. All right. Peace.